Good evening and welcome everyone to the latest installment of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's virtual governing members lounge. Again, I'm happy to serve as your host, Alison Burr Livingston, the BSO's Vice President of Development. Um, and again, welcome you not only to my home, but thank you for inviting us into yours. Uh, again, our donor lounges, both at the Meyerhoff and at Strathmore are places for exclusive conversation, um, including insights with special guest artists and special guests in general. Um, so during these times, we are committed to not only extending that opportunity to continue conversation with our donors, but also our entire family of BSO patrons, new and old. Um, tonight, uh, we are still live, so it means that if you're watching on the BSO's offstage web pages, uh, you can submit any questions that you may have for me or any of our guests uh, to our email address offstage, all one word, at bsomusic.org. If you happen to be watching on the BSO's YouTube channel, you can also chat your question uh, in the chat feature, both of which are being monitored, and we'll get to that at the latter portion of this evening's conversation. Uh, but again, tonight, we are actually continuing a broader theme. It's the BSO's Symphony in Space Digital Festival this week, all in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope, which has some interesting connections to our home here in Maryland. Um, for such a conversation, I don't think I could be joined by two better guests. Uh, those include our very own European Space Agency Hubble project scientist, Dr. Antonella Nota, um, as well as the BSO's own associate conductor, Nicholas Hirsch. So thank you both for joining us. I'm going to do a little bit of intro so everyone knows a little bit more about who you are and why you are the lucky folks who get to mumble through with me this evening. Um, so Antonella, I believe that in your day job as the Space Telescope Science Center Institute's associate director for the European Space Agency, that's a, that's a lengthy title, um, that you're responsible actually for all Hubble outreach efforts in Europe. Um, as a project scientist for James Webb guest observers, you direct all science policies and public communications that support the James Webb Space Telescope. So clearly I know you've got not only a lot of expertise, but you brought some great images to share this evening as well. Um, and actually, I think you are our first actual governing member who's joining us as a guest in the virtual governing members lounge, which I think is only fitting and appropriate. So thank you for your support. And thank you for all that you do to advocate for really the intersections of arts and science. I know that you shared with me some um, former partnerships that you have worked on with other artists and curators, including uh, From the Distant Past, which was a project in collaboration with the German artist, Tim Otto Roth, that involved uh, signals from different galaxies that were observed by Hubble, that were projected on the facades of buildings. Um, be it in Venice, Italy, New York, and I think right here in Baltimore, um, or another project, uh, Our Place in Space, in collaboration with curator and historian Anna Caterina Bellotti, um, that had 10 prominent Italian artists interpreting Hubble images. So I hope that we'll learn a little bit more about all of those tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, and Nick, I think you joined the BSO's family in 2014, was it? Uh, that's right. It's been uh, almost six years now. Yeah. It's amazing. And in that time, you have done a lot to really expand the reach of the orchestra. Um, I think people will recognize you from many things on the BSO podium, be it our Pulse concerts, which um, really was a, a concept that you helped bring to life that brought together indie bands and orchestral musicians. Um, if anyone has watched any of our live orchestra with film productions or participated in some of our past GM, Lav, live, uh, GM Lounge conversations, you know how to conduct with a click track. Um, and actually, I think uh, everyone will also recognize you from other subscription concerts. Um, what I don't know if everyone who sees you on the main podium knows is that you are an avid educator and that you actually serve as also as the artistic director of all of the Baltimore Symphony's youth orchestras, as well as direct educational and family programming. So thank you for everything that you do uh, to help bring music and music education to our young folks. It is entirely my privilege and, pl and pleasure. Thank you for that. Wonderful. Well, let's get right into it. Um, I think it's not a not a big secret, Antonella, but we hear tomorrow is a very special day. Can you tell us a little oh. bit more what's happening? Thank you, Alison. Thank you for your introduction. Yes, we're very excited about tomorrow because we are celebrating 30 years of the Hubble Space Telescope. And Hubble is actually one of the hidden treasures in Baltimore. 
not many people in the audience know that actually the um, institute that does the science operation for Hubble is based in Baltimore and is on the premises of Johns Hopkins University at the Hop uh, Hopkins campus. Um, of course, the data come down to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, and then they are routed to us. And we take care of all the calibrations and the productions of the beautiful images that you will see in a few minutes. Um, Hubble really is an extraordinary machine. Uh, it has now, you know, been out there 350 nautical miles uh, outside the Earth's atmosphere. That's exactly what allowed uh, Hubble to take those sharp images. They're not blurred by the effect of the atmosphere. And it has been um, an amazing success. Uh, of scientific breakthroughs, but also inspirational uh, images of the universe that have been brought into people's home. Uh, we sometimes call Hubble the people's telescope because uh, it has brought the universe into, into our houses in a way that probably no other mission had done before. So yes, we are located in Baltimore. Uh, this was because in the 1970s approximately, NASA issued a call to uh, institutions in the US to host this science center for Hubble. And uh, the physics department of Johns Hopkins University decided to make this ambitious bet. And uh, in a tough competition with Princeton, they succeeded, actually Arthur Davidson succeeded in bringing Hubble to Baltimore. The institute was created in 19 at the beginning of the 1980s and it has been devoted to this mission uh, and now we will run from space telescope also the future james webb space telescope which will be the successor uh, to hubble uh, one important thing to mention about hubble uh, hubble could not exist without the support of many people and i want to talk especially of, of two categories of people first our beloved Senator Barbara Mikulski, yes, who yes. has been an amazing advocate for science, uh, for the telescope itself, for our institution, for Maryland. I think um, Senator Barb has a supernova named in her honor. Uh, and uh, if you're watching, uh, I hope you will be very proud of what you will see tomorrow of what you have actually enabled. Uh, the second category of people were extremely grateful to are the astronauts, because the astronauts are really the people, the courageous heroes who have made Hubble the success that it is today. Hubble was designed to be refurbished by astronauts in space. And actually astronauts with the space shuttle went up there five times and every time they fixed you know, what was broken, they installed the new instruments, they made sure the Hubble was in left as pristine as on day one of its life. And that's why it has been so successful for 30 years because it has basically evolved with the pace of science. And at every servicing mission, new instruments were installed which were designed exactly to address the key questions that astronomers had at that time. And we see even now, even today, the last servicing mission was in 2009, and then the space shuttle program was, uh, was closed. Uh, so from 2009 to today, the telescope is still in the best, best possible uh, shape uh, ever, all the instruments are functioning great and it's in high demand. We receive typically a thousand proposals every year from the astronomical community all around the world to uh, obtain time in peer review process uh, on Hubble. So uh, the scientific productivity is amazing. The breakthrough, the scientific breakthroughs uh, are basically rewritten completely our understanding of the universe. And uh, in addition, Hubble has uh, produced so many beautiful images, which we're going to, to see here uh, displayed in the next few slides, 
which have really uh, infiltrated completely our culture. Uh, we see these images pretty much appearing everywhere. We started noticing this uh, 10, 20 years ago that suddenly beautiful Hubble images would appear in, uh, in movies. This is, for example, one of the iconic ones, the pillars of creation. We call it just because, you know, it's a magnificent view of uh, star forming regions. There are these uh, uh, pillars of dust and gas are actually uh, the home and the nursery for new stars that are being formed. And we can, we can see the small, the young stars just emerging from this cocoon. So this has been one of the iconic images. But uh, the, the, or the bubble nebula that you see here, another spectacular image. So these images have really uh, infiltrated the culture and have really contributed to inspire uh, the public at large in ways that I think no other space mission had done before. Um, the, the educational value of just making science approachable and accessible to all you can go on our website and download these beautiful images and put them on your screen. They're free, they're available, they are easy to take and you can enjoy viewing. There are millions of them and uh, one uh, more beautiful than the other. Um, I think that this, this contribution is, I think to me, the most important contribution in addition, of course, to the uh, scientific discoveries, the, the Nobel Prize in Physics that was given in 2011 for the Accelerating Universe to our own uh, Baltimore-based Adam Rees together with two colleagues. But uh, there is this value that the images connect the universe with the individual at the level that probably no other space mission had done before. Well, thank you so much, Antonella. I think you're also so spot on, not only to, um, to talk about the, obviously the science and the history, but I think it's so fitting actually that we're having this conversation with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and we're talking about Maryland being the home of, of Hubble. And also thank you so much for acknowledging the important role that, that um, and other supporters of this wonderful organization like Senator Mikulski um, have played in this, in this project. And I know that she um, is, is eager to, to um, uh, probably, I'm sure, see everything that happens tomorrow, and I'm sure get back into great collaboration with us in the future. So thank you. Um, Nick, I wanted to turn it over to you. Um, this is not the first time in this conversation that you're, you're meeting Antonella. I know that you actually had a chance to work with her and some of her colleagues in curating programs. Um, originally for this week, you know, we had had plans to do the full midweek education concert series through the telescope, which I know that actually we still kind of created the spirit of and debuted a great watch party on Facebook earlier this week. So I do encourage everyone to check that out on the BSO social media pages if they haven't already. Um, and obviously for, for uh, programs, including Hulse the Planets. Um, how did you approach that collaboration? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, well, it was great to, you know, just um, uh, have a chance to visit this amazing um, facility and, and an institute right here in our own backyard. And I, and I lived in, in Hamden um, for for several years. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I went jogging by, you know, on, on San Mateo Drive all the time. It's beautiful with the beautiful ravine next to next door. And, you know, we we went in with it with this concept of a of a program to, you know, uh, really give us a give our our our, um, our students a sense of what space is about to pair with some some great imagery we went in and met this whole uh, amazing team of individuals from the from the institute and we just kind of sat in a room and bounced ideas off of each other we got to see a lot of the the most beautiful images on a really big screen and we, uh, there were times when we went um, oh yeah you know I, I want to do this piece of uh, that, that that involves um, uh, you know the, the Andromeda Galaxy. What do you have for that? And then he pulled a. Uh, we saw this 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 amazing um, a video that they had they created of of um, a composite Hubble images where you essentially fly through the Andromeda Galaxy, and it's yes. just, it's it's my, it was mind bogglingly cool for a, for a, 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 some someone who's been interested in the in in this kind of stuff for for, for a while. That's me. Um, it, it was cool to to sort of you know combine these these aspects of my of my interests. 
That's amazing. Well, I can only imagine. I wish I was there. Um, but actually, I think on that point, one of my next questions, and, and, and a live viewer, Len, has kind of beat me to the punch. He asked, who initiates the development of a BSO presentation like Holst the Planets, who initiates the partnership, be it with NASA, with STSCI, et cetera, to provide the visual images? Nick, can you talk about, you know, not only how the role of conductor and in your role transcends from the podium to influence these types of programs? Sure. Well, I mean, programming is is kind of, um, you know, the conductor does not only stand up on the podium and work with the orchestra, but that's the tip of the iceberg, really. The conductor's job really happens a lot behind the scenes, whether we're studying music or, in this case, programming music and making things work, making a concert work from the, from the ground up. So I work with an amazing team from the, from the BSO um for the for the for the fifth telescope program, um, uh, the, our midweek and youth orchestra, our our youth uh, music for youth programs, um, uh, we we worked with um, uh, 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 the the concept, I guess, of mm -hmm. what a, a kind of journey through space, um, thanks to the Hubble, would look like, and we came um, we came up with this idea of essentially it's a journey. You start at Earth. And you progress further out um, from our uh, th through our solar system, visiting the planets, featuring the great music of Holst, and that oh, you get to see see my cat here too. This is Musetta, um, and um, and uh, and then journeying further out into the into the universe. Oh, she's playing the piano for us too. That's great. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, it, it was a, it was a really great concept I think to start with, and then it was just it, and then knowing that we that we would pair that music with with some some brilliant imagery from from Hubble and the SDSCI. So um, yeah, that's that's essentially the process. Kind of we we in this case we kind of started with the general concept for the music, and then worked to to, to pair it with. With the STSCI, and then for the the, the whole sp the, the actual planets program, we worked very closely with them again uh, at the institute itself to to come up with um, uh, images and and video that would fit perfectly the the timing of the the Holst movements because those those we can't change. We want we want to make sure that that the music itself for Holst stays stays as a as it's been composed essentially. Thank you, Nick. And clearly, all of this is so is such long lead time, right? I mean, when was your first visit to the institute? It was probably. I guess it was in January. Um, okay. uh, it, it must have been in January, but I mean, our our initial talks initiated probably more along the lines of September of 2019 or so, at least at the very yes. least. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, during the summer. Yes. Right. We were right, thinking right, right. that we could start this great collaboration because two amazing institutions in Baltimore uh, with an incredible potential for projects, educational projects for the future. It's really, it was too compelling to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly. Uh, well, again, I'm so glad that to do this conversation as part of this week's still digital festival. Um, Antonella, I wanted to, to get back to you. You know, you clearly shared some amazing images from Hubble and what a wealth of, uh, selection that that it has truly captured over that 30 years. Um, would you be able to expand a little bit about what Hubble has captured in terms of planets from our own solar system as we begin to talk a little bit about Hulse work? Of course. Uh, Hubble observes uh, frequently planets in our solar system and uh, it's interesting to see that um, the images, of course, from a distance very close to the Earth, uh, the images are not as detailed and as sharp as we have seen from some uh, other missions like the rover, you know, Curiosity rover or the Voyagers, which actually can uh, go very close to the surface and, and do amazing detail work. But what Hubble has done that is uh, truly unique, has been able to look at this planet over and over and over in time, over the 30 years. So we have been checking, you know, phenomena that have been varying, transients, uh, particular features, and we have been documenting all that. So for example, you see here a beautiful picture of Mars, the red planet, uh, very similar, probably the closest uh, similar planet to planet Earth with a thin atmosphere. Uh, the color red is because of the iron oxide that is on the surface. 
and uh, we can see all the features that have been you know recognized before were known even you know if you have a good uh, telescope from the ground you can see some of that but then if we go to the next slide to the next image you can see how these features do change like for example when this image was taken there were incredible dust storms you see that you you almost see that the dust storms kind of blurs away the feature because it was a period of intense uh, of intense storm activity and the white clouds are icy clouds that basically form uh, in a sort of a, a weather pattern and they were in this case almost blurring and covering the polar icy caps that we see very well in every image so Hubble is contributing to create a baseline now this is an image where the dust storm have settled so you can see again all the details that you know on the Mars surface and you can see very well the, the icy cap. Uh, if we go to the next image, Saturn is a, a planet that we all uh, are very familiar because of the ring structure. Uh, Hubble again continues to monitor the, the, this planet. And for example, what we see here, this interesting uh, aurora, uh, the blue area at the top, is actually an aurora like exactly we see on our own planet you know the aurora borealis they are created by the interaction of the charged particles from the sun with the magnetic field of the planet and they're variable and the reason why it's blue there is a reason is because this observation the observation of the aurora has been taken in the ultraviolet because hubble is outside the atmosphere can observe in this part of the light spectrum that our eye cannot observe. And, uh, and so the ultraviolet observations, which are basically very important to find very energetic phenomena are very important to, to show us what's happening on the planet. Neptune is uh, a icy giant, cold icy giant in the very um, uh, distant part of our solar system. And again, if we see in the next slide, an example of what happens when you go and look at this planet over and over again and you see over time how features like this very interesting vortex you know form create and dissolve and this is really an a gold mine for astronomer because they can then go and feed this information to their models and understand exactly what happens on the surface on that planet Wonderful, thank you so much. And I think thinking about you know descriptors such as you know the icy giant for Neptune, for example, we've had thirty years of these beautiful images. But you know Nick uh, Holst wrote his Planet Suite in nineteen sixteen, and he clearly didn't have anything close to that level of detail. So I wonder if you could help tie us into the music and talk a little bit about Holst's process for creating these musical worlds. Absolutely, and yeah, um, so it's interesting. So Holst. He wasn't quite an astronomy buff, but he was uh, an absolute diehard astrology buff. Now, of course, these these things are very, very tied into e to each other. Um, you know, they, it, it start, starts back from from the days of the ancient Greeks, essentially, who look up at the sky and see that um, okay, here are, here are all these dots in the sky that stay still. But oh my God, here are these things that if you track them slowly, they move across the sky, they must be gods. And so the, the concept of astrology evolves into essentially uh, a human personality and human interaction at some level um, uh, being somehow related to the movements of these planets. Um, and so Holst based his music more on the, the sort of mystical side of this. And um, uh, so it, I think he, he does it really in two primary ways um, f for us uh, listening today. This is sort of, if, you, if you're going to watch the watch party at 8 p.m. with the BSO playing alive with images, um, you'll, this is sort of the mini off the cuff for that. So, yeah. um, and we'll I'm talk gonna, about how people can do that before we end. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to um, move over to my screen here. So this is the, the, t the, the sort of front matter of the score for Holst. And really what I wanted to, f to show you while watching um, is how big this orchestra is. Um, 
I mean, it's not the biggest orchestra that I, that that ever was to this period. Wagner, Mahler certainly take the cake for that. But I mean, this is massive, 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 massive. You get four on a part woodwinds, not not one but two tubas, a tenor tuba and a bass tuba, two timpani players playing six timpani, all this percussion, um, two harps, an organ, a whole string section, of course, and then in the finale in Neptune. You, you, you get one of the most amazing effects in, in, in music, I think, and we'll get to that in, in a second. And you can see how this looks here in the beginning of the, the piece. I mean, th this score is just massive. It's, it's, and he really uses the orchestra in a very almost mystical way to some extent. Um, and musically, we're going to see, see if I can zoom in here a little bit. Yeah, here we go. So we're, going, we're looking at the strings, and this is Mars, the very, the very first first movement of Holst's piece, and I want to focus on this marking here, Colenio. So if you know the piece, you, you, you may be familiar with this somewhat, but this technique called Colenio has to do um, so much with what, what I'm talking about here with, with Holst's use of the orchestra. Um, he, he gives this martial rhythm from Mars, the god of war, essentially. But it's, first of all, it's not a regular rhythm, it's a, it's a weird rhythm in five. Um, and he gives it to the strings to start out, not not just the regular way, but colenio with the wood of the bow. And it goes on and on and on like that. And this rhythm, ta 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 one, two, three, four, five. It's a very diabolical kind of thing. And then you get the first tune. And this thing, that's what we call a tritone. And this is um, um, throughout music history known as something like the devil's interval. It, that, that interval itself, it's very weird. It's very mystical, again. And that interval, that harmony keeps coming back all through um, this piece. You know, at the, at the very end of Mars, you get these massive chords with, all built on this tritone. <laughs> get this again there's that tritone that's how Mars ends and if you move through the piece you can track how, how this tritone evolves and moves through the orchestra in Saturn for instance I love that we, that, that we looked at these planets in particular um, here we go this is how Saturn starts Oops. these are all tritones again he weaves this in to create this sense of otherworldliness, literally, literally. I mean, we are, we are talking about other worlds here. And then Saturn being, in this case, the bringer of old age, it's a clock. The weirdest clock that, that ever was, was composed. It's really, it's really something else. And then if we look at Neptune, um, Neptune has this, this, this incredible thing. It starts out simply like this. It goes... And this isn't quite a tritone, but it's really interesting too because you get this alternation of two harmonies, E minor and then G sharp minor, over and over again, over and over and over again. It, it doesn't quite resolve, it just kind of keeps going and keeps going. Neptune, the mystic it's called. And then here in this movement we get this, word, this wordless choir that starts, that, that it, you, you don't ever see this choir. It's all backstage. It's all female voices. They don't sing a, sing, a single lyric. It's all just totally at, atmospheric. And the way it ends, he ends it with this, with this wordless choir just fading out. And even within that, tritone again. And so he's he's kind of kept this thread of mystical harmony all the way through this and used the whole inst the whole orchestral uh, accommodations that, that you can find with this massive massive orchestra to create all sorts of weird and wonderful sounds. And I want to leave you with one thing. The the way Neptune began with these two harmonies 
it reminds me very much of This is the exact same harmonic progression that John Williams uses for the most famous outer space music I think we know right now. And this is really Holst's legacy. This, this, the, these concepts of massive orchestrations and these really, really inventive harmonic co combinations that have lent um, inspiration to so many, especially cinematic c composers uh, today. Yeah. Well, I think that that makes total sense. And Thank you for not only showing your prowess on the keyboard, but also your cello. I don't know if everyone knows that you're a cellist by nature as well. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly good at either right now, but I'm a much better cellist than I am a pianist. <laughs> better than I, so you already have me impressed. Um, before I get back to Antonella, I kind of want to interject with another live audience question, just because it really continues with what you were saying. And again, I think everyone's really tuned in tonight. And this is a question, Nick, for you from William. And he talks about, you know, Holst's music as exploring a wide variety of themes. You talked already about, obviously, with the planets and his interest in astrology. Um, but William mentions, you know, English folk music, mm. to the Veda, to obviously the astrological influences. What do you think accounts for kind of the breadth of his musical interests? Well, I think that's 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 exactly the concept. I mean, he was such a, a polymath. He um, he mm -hmm. loved uh, he loved a, a whole variety of stuff. And towards especially towards this 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 period when he was writing the planets, he was starting to combine all of this. Yeah, the 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 the, the harmonies he d he discovered in it, in Indian music, um, combining with. Um, uh, uh, some of the, the sort of simplicity of English folk tunes. Of course, you get that that um, altogether famous hymn in Jupiter. That that's essentially. It, it also happens, I think, very very importantly, right at the center of the whole suite is where that hymn comes. Right in the middle movement, in the middle of the middle movement, you get this beautiful beautiful hymn that's that that could have been been hummed while walking down an English countryside road essentially um and I, and I think it's the way he sort of sets that up he, he sets these these simple songs up to be um almost more glorious than they than they have any any right to be because of his use of uh, of, of 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 again this massive massive orchestra and yeah he loved he he he, he was totally an eclectic he, he he loved lots and lots of different kinds of music and, and started to weave them all together in in pieces like the planets well thank you so much nick for expanding on that and i really do think that it's a wonderful almost mini off the cuff you just gave to help people be able to 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 really enjoy and totally appreciate and be able to follow through some of those themes tritones included um, when they're watching the full hosts uh, watch party tonight. So again, we'll end on that. And we've got a couple more minutes. So we're gonna get through a few more questions sure. before we do so. Um, Antonella, I wanna turn back to you. You know, clearly you've seen millions of Hubble photos. What are your favorites and what's the science behind them? I will just uh, talk about one, uh, one image which I took uh, five years ago. And uh, to me, this image kind of uh, summarizes the beauty of having a telescope like Hubble uh, working. This is a stellar nursery. This is a place where stars are born. Astronomers are always interesting to understand how things form and how they evolve. So this is an example of a cluster of stars that is very young. So I will tell you the age, three million years. Seems a long time on astronomical scale is basically they are toddler stars. They're just out of their cocoon. They just have started shining of their own light. And Hubble allows us to count them one by one and, and see what they are and what are their properties, what are their temperatures. And for astronomers, this is just like being in a candy shop. Um, it's really incredible. In addition, it's such a beautiful image that was selected to be the 25th anniversary, 25th anniversary. Uh, similar thing, uh, and this is a little farther away, but we still can count all the individual stars. There are like 80,000 stars uh, in this image. And finally, uh, probably my, my favorite. Um, this is another example of a stellar nursery. The beauty of this object is that it is an area where there is nothing else. So we are wondering what, what led to the formation because we can see through it. We can see the galaxies in the background. 
and it's just such a fascinating, in addition to be beautiful, it's such a fascinating object. So I think it, so, yes. No, I was just gonna say thank you for sharing. I was gonna make some comment about stellar nursery and being the parent of a toddler and trying to compare <laughs> the two, but I won't. And her artwork does nothing to compare to, to that. Um, and you mentioned obviously the 25th and we've talked again that we were, tomorrow was the 30th anniversary of Hubble. Can you give us a little teaser as to what's happening specifically tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow we're going to unveil the 30th anniversary image. So every image we, we you know, advertise, we show a special image that Hubble has taken. And the one of tomorrow is just phenomenal. It's probably one of the best ever taken. It's one of those images that basically connects right with your soul. And that's the connection with music and art that we have discussed, uh, that uh, Nick has discussed so effectively up to now. So let's wish Hubble a happy birthday because today, tomorrow is really a major milestone. Uh, tune on our social media. There is a lot of stuff happening and keep an eye on the spectacular anniversary image. Wonderful, well, thank you so much. Antonella for that. And certainly we will all have to, to, we'll end our evening tonight with a cheers for a happy birthday cheers. But before we do, um, Nick, I wanted to turn it back to you for one other question before I remind people how to tune into the watch party. One is the fact that, you know, you, uh, you've been with the BIOS, as we said, since 2014, it clearly must be so much fun working on programs such as this. Um, I want to ask about some of your other favorite projects during your time here, what you're looking forward to in the future. And when you think about that, there's one other question that came, came through and I think you should just address it, um, where someone has asked that if it's true that as part of your role as associate conductor, that you have to learn virtually every one of the pieces that the BSO plays all season long, so that if Meister Alsop or any of our other conductors does not feel well, that you must be ready to step in at a moment's notice. Is that true? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll address that one first, I think. Um, for the most part, yes. Um, especially, um, you know, so uh, during, during my role now as associate conductor, I have enough other duties that, um, so what, the, what the, the, the person asking the question is talking about, we call that covering when you, it's a, uh, understudying essentially. So I have less covering um, uh, in a regular season now than, than when I started, um, because I just have, I have more of my own concerts to do um, uh, these days, um, or uh, earlier in the season. But um, uh, the, yeah, when I, when I started as, as assistant conductor, I, uh, I was covering virtually every subscription concert the BSO did. And yeah, I mean, part of, part of the job is to um, get have have enough of a baseline knowledge of these scores that you can, um, uh, you know, get to rehearsal. Both take in what uh, the music director or the guest conductor is is adding to um, to this uh, with the, with the BSO, um, uh, while also being able to just kind of jump in and and um, and be able to to, to conduct. But uh, I, that's it, it has happened to me before once once at the BSO. But luckily there was a good amount of notice for that. So um, uh, that 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 was that, that that always helps to get to get a little bit more than yeah. you know like an hour's notice or something like that. No, I'm sure, and I'm sure that the hour's notice does not necessarily inform your favorite moments, uh, maybe the high stress. But... Right, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, but to to your question, Allison. Um, Yes, I, you know it's been just just a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, six years of of musical growth and experimentation and just just um, just enjoyment for me of uh, just like I'm I'm in total awe of the musicianship of uh, of the BSO and Meister Alsop and all of the all of the, the the incredible soloists and get and guest conductors we have um, uh, working with this with this amazing orchestra. Um, I would say my favorite. Um, projects have been usually the, the collaborations. Um, I think back to maybe yeah, it must have been 2016. We, it, we, uh, it, it was just for a, a, a one-off show, but we had Yo-Yo here for a, for a, um, uh, I think it was a special, I guess, but we had the, the Orc Kids come in and do an encore with Yo-Yo, which I both arranged and uh, mm -hmm. played on stage with as well and that's just that 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 memory is just is 
to, I mean, where else but the BSO? I think is is a uh, is um, uh, could could something like that happen? Um, and I and I I love working on all all of our galas with the Orchids encores as well because again it's it's all about collaboration. The Pulse concerts, as you mentioned, um, some of some of my my most most incredible musical experiences there. And again, it all has to do with with um, finding new new cross connections essentially new new ways of contextualizing um uh, music both music that we're familiar with as classical music lovers and also music like like indie bands playing and and finding the the shared common ground Wonderful. well thank you nick for sharing that and i think that's a really apt way i know we're coming up on on about time for tonight but thinking about the power of collaboration and connection I do hope that everyone who's watching will consider joining for the BSO's live watch party for a full sensory experience of the whole of hosts the planets. Um, nothing can recreate the magic of a live BSO performance. However, um, in addition to having a full archived auditory performance of the BSO performing the piece, I think it's from 2008, um, we've now paired that beautiful music. Um, that mystical world that Hulse, Hulse created with video imagery from NASA's Gard Goddard Space Flight Ugh. Goddard Space Flight Center. You guys are really testing my um, my tongue ties tonight, um, which I think it's not only images but also video Im imagery. Um, so it is truly dynamic. Um, anyone who would like to watch that it is live, so you can't watch it on demand, but you have to go right at eight o'clock. And anyone can go to the bsomusic.org offstage page, find the GM Live Lounge, and there is a link for where you can register to add your email and then be able to click right through to, to view the event. So I hope that everyone will, will check that out. Um, thank you so much, Antonella and Nick, for joining us and sharing um, your knowledge your imagery, uh, your insights, Nick. And um, I really look forward to, to seeing what we have tonight. And also I invite everyone to join us again next week. I believe we're gonna be joined by, again, our own music director, Marin Alsop, and possibly a special guest pianist, Olga Kern, for a more classically focused conversation. Um, so in the interim, let's do a cheers and a happy birthday to Hubble, Nick with water, but it all works. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week, Thursday at five. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you.